trying to start the script. Mm -hmm. back. Hi everyone, I'm Julian. I'm Adam. And of course I'm Gabo. Welcome to our research project for Last 315. Our research, based on both the text we've read and our experience over the last six weeks, was centered around the food and drink of the Andes. More specifically, the ways in which Andean food and drink reflect themes surrounding Andean indigeneity that we've explored throughout the course. To explore, for example, some of the impacts of colonialism and some of the ways indigenous culture and people have um, persevered. Analyzing the food and drink here has been a unique and interesting lens. Well, to avoid boring you lovely people to death with some more monologuing, here's a clip from the movie El Boca del Lobo that most of us watched that offers a summary introduction to the video. <laughs> No sea malo, pechinito, cabece molleja. <risa> Oye, Carlito, ¿Ah? ¿usted cree que, que hay alguien que nos pueda preparar un cevichito? ¿Ceviche de qué quieres hoy? ¿De llama? No te llamas. ¿Ceviche de llama? ¿Qué pendejo le olvidé el segundo? ¿Charquipapa? ¿El postre, el postre, el postre, el postre? ¿El lado de yuco, me compadre? <risa> Dried llama, legume, potatoes, icy roots, aka ice cream made from yuca. These foods define the Andean diet as opposed to the seafood that Lima is known for. While the soldiers are just talking about food, their condescending tone betrays their impression of Lima as a modern city as opposed to the temporally frozen Andes. Food is not just food, but rather stands in for social prejudice and values. In this case, these particular foods are linked to a particular conception of indigenous people as backwards. Contemporary Peruvian sensibilities, at least within the mainstream, have shifted somewhat. And just as Machu Picchu has become celebrated as a cornerstone of Peruvian culture over the past century, ingredients from extreme altitudes in the Andes and in the rainforest have been embraced as an essential part of Peruvian cuisine in Peru's recent gastronomic revolution. The chef Gaston Acurio, whose name is associated with the restaurant Chicha we went to, has been given a lot of credit for this revolution. We'll explore his impact later on. The movie clip and its negative connotations regarding the food encapsulate our project theme of food as representative of Andean indigeneity and its complicated existence within Peru. Acknowledged, yet chock full of prejudice. Whether it reflects a geographic rivalry between coast or highlands is simply part of my Lomo Saltado. The ever-present food of the Andean region highlights how Andean indigeneity resists, survives, and thrives. On Saturday, Julian and I ventured out to see which of these products were, in fact, grown around Pizac and in the Andes. We met a woman who had a large variety of grains, seeds, and other crops, like potatoes and corn, on display. When we asked her, it was actually another customer answered, todos, todos son de aquí. For reference, that means all of them are from here. The nativity of these products connects to a long-standing practice here in the Andes of cultivation and consumption started by the indigenous cultures of the region countless years ago. As Garcia Lasso's account highlights, crops like corn, potatoes, quinoa, and oca were integral to the agriculture of the Inca Empire, a group that was continuing and building upon the agricultural practices of indigenous groups that came before. With the presence of these very same crops, we can trace a line through the history of the Andes and see the persistent practices and continued importance of said crops that have been integral to so many indigenous people and empires. But of course, the tracing of this line is political and can be mobilized to colonial or otherwise problematic ends. As a specific example of an account of indigenous agriculture is what John Mira coined as the vertical archipelago. This describes how indigenous agrarian cultures would cooperate across altitudes. Essential to the vertical archipelago is the cultivation of plants which thrive in highland or altiplano conditions, such as some varieties of Peru's potatoes. In conjunction with lowland crops, indigenous communities are able to remain self-sufficient. Resources are centralized in a core region, but are redistributed as per the norm of reciprocity. It would be in poor taste not to mention the cultivation of Andean land without including the era of feudalism, 
wealthy landowners, and the oppressed peasantry made up of largely indigenous Andeans. The Ladifundio system, introduced to the Andes by Spanish colonialism, organized agricultural production into an exploitative and oppressive regime, and stole the products of the land from its primarily indigenous cultivators. As Hugo Blanco points out, the system encouraged the abuse and murder of indigenous workers who remained at the whim of their landowners. A few of us have actually stayed in a building that was formerly an hacienda, the Florencio. In an infamous move of resistance and solidarity, Julian vomited and also pooped on the bathroom floor. Some revolutions don't need to be televised. And while we can now see instances of food being sold by countless individual vendors and not solely the gluttonous, wealthy landlords of a past age, remnants of that past system, both physical like the hacienda, and in signs and discourse, still haunt the present. In fact, PSAC still has a large disparity in land ownership, which has been increasing since after the conclusion of Velasco's agrarian reform. Around the year 2000, Alberto Fujimori's neoliberal administration privileged the purchase of land by individuals and multinational corporations. A white American expat named Diane Dunn, who purchased land for Centro Paz y Luz during that period, is actually largely responsible for the recent increase in tourism in the PSAC region. Many in the know have cited her book on Cusco and her center as the single most important factor for this rise. Dozens of European and North American New Age entrepreneurs have followed her example and purchased land in the area, a lot of which was farmland. Even Dunn herself has a hard time keeping up with rising property costs. This takeover of Andean land is intrinsically linked to food production and indigenous agricultural practices, which we have been consumers of this entire trip. We have seen very gentrified restaurants taking up the majority of prime space in the heart of Pisac, while most other restaurants, more frequented by locals, are along the main through road. Of course, we don't only see Andean crops for sale on their lonesome in the market on Sundays. They're present in almost every dish we've eaten on this trip. The dishes we've seen, eaten, and read about during our time here demonstrate the countless culinary influences, both extra-regional and extra-national, that have shaped contemporary Peruvian cuisine. Present in nearly all cases of these dishes are the ingredients of the Andes, like potatoes, corn, and quinoa, to name a few. Andean ingredients such as potatoes and corn have become staples in a variety of European diets. The inverse is also true, since limes and onions, crucial to ceviche, are not native to the Andes, pointing to a colonial and globalized fusion within Andean regions. Causa is considered a dish from Lima. But as you might guess from the presence of potatoes, this dish has a larger Andean influence. It is composed of various scraps, something of a kitchen sink creation made of ingredients available for troops who are fighting in the Pacific War. In fact, causa directly translates to cause. It is a highly patriotic dish in its contemporary form. Ceviche also has a fascinating history. It's an ancient dish, but was only served fresh once Nikkei, or Japanese immigrants, introduced the sashimi style of preparation. What was previously a dish for poor fishermen is now a symbol of Lima's culinary mastery. Lima's cuisine is the result of a confluence of different cultures, one of those being that, or a few of those being, that of the Andes. Lima's gastronomic figurehead, Gaston, is well aware of this fact. His own view is that Lima is a mestizo race, where the breakdown of cultural barriers is to be celebrated. In other words, Lima's fusion is the strength. Yet, as alluded to above, the Andes are also home to many producers of, fruit, of ingredients enjoyed all over Peru. Yet the region is not afforded nearly the same international respect. One producer, Aida, whose interview is described in Garcia's book called Gastropolitics and the Specter of Race, is disappointed with the limiting narrative that is now all too common. Indigenous Andeans are linked with their lands in such a manner that, as to be perceived as immobile. She highlights that not only can there be indigenous land, but also indigenous roots. Routes. Ida is familiar with Mura's vertical archipelago, and she emphasizes that modern producers should also be seen as mobile, cooperative agents. They do not merely belong in one location. Indigeneity can be about travel. Beyond this, she also speculates that indigenous travel and resource distribution need not be confined only to its historical form. Indigenous mobility is an evolving concept. She's engaging in a strategic retelling of indigenous history to gain a bigger seat at the fine dining table. Her desire is that producers obtain a larger cut of the profits being made in Lima, that the visibility of indigenous Andean producers take on a different, less victimizing character, and that the state aids producers' productive capabilities. Alongside her account, some criticism of Gaston is warranted as well. 
Garcia discusses a TED Talk by Gaston called Can Home Cooking Change the World? In it, Gaston gives the example of a Cantonese and Italian couple who meet in Lima and get married against their parents' wishes. They get into arguments because she puts soy sauce in everything, of course, and he does the same with Parmesan cheese. Eventually they compromise and the food is all the better for it. Gaston uses this as a metaphor for the story of Peruvian cuisine. Cultural differences are mended by the force of love and natural attraction. Contemporary Peruvian cuisine is a product of these forces, and for Gaston is a new mestizaje vision of the nation. Garcia claims that Gaston's discussion of a beautiful and tolerant fusion is actually a glorifying vision of Peru as a country integrated and reconciled, one that accepts the colonial encounter as mutually beneficial for the indigenous peoples of Peru, such as those in the Andes. It is a vision that erases the complex colonial histories and structures that brought these different peoples from all over the world together, that have done incredible violence to indigenous Peruvians, and that have deeply impacted the social and class divisions within Peruvian society today. Paradoxically, Gaston's celebration of the beauty of difference serves to eliminate it. Garcia claims that Gaston's vision of beautiful fusion is also a rearticulation of mestizaje, a national ideology of inclusion throughout Latin America. Think of Che Guevara's claim that all Latin Americans are one race. The problem of some of these ideologies of mestizaje is that if you are not mixed enough, you are not a proper national subject. An indigenous Andean may be overdefined in their role as an agricultural producer, for example, and not be seen as a chef like Gaston, capable of representing the diversity of Peruvian cuisine. Mestizaje can also function as a rhetoric of exclusion that continues to essentialize races or cultures. However, Gaston is right to admire the diversity of Peruvian cuisine. As we all probably know, it is delicious. I want to talk a little bit about Chifa. Fun for, fact for the Chinese ones, and maybe Grace, Chifa likely comes from Sik Fan. Uh, Chifa is close to home for me. I remember having chapa de carne at the Pisac market and being surprised that 2,972 meters above sea level, all the way here in the Andes, it tasted just or better in some ways than the Cantonese food I was used to back home. Uh, that was the second time that Dina made it, and it was a Fesis 4.5. She also made it a 4 and two 3.5s, the same thing. Chifa is not just the fusion of two culinary traditions, but the fusion of many culinary traditions which are already themselves fusions. Look at this picture, for example. As much as it is the product of love, it is much more the product of innovation in the face of the violence of specific economic and colonial contexts. Around 300,000 South Chinese workers, or coolies, almost entirely male, came from the mid-19th to early 20th centuries as a replacement for slave labor. Chifa evolved as an adaptation to specific ingredients and specific local needs and tastes. Chifa is both an adaptation of Peruvian traditions to Chinese cuisine and Chinese traditions to Peruvian cuisine. Paradoxically, while for Peruvians, Chifa represents the Chinese tradition, among Chinese people, Chifa is considered foreign cuisine. In an article on Chifa, Mitternik claims that some dishes have achieved such a perfect union between both traditions. They have ultimately shaped the success and very existence of Chifa cuisine. Apparently, this is the case of the Aeropuerto Especial. Um, he says that the name gives the dish an almost visionary feel for traveling people, such as the coolies. Unfortunately, this was not my experience. As you can see by the picture, uh, Fesis 3 is stretching it. Anyways, uh, we think that mestizaje is a good concept to use, perhaps, to emphasize the complicated processes, cuisines, and definitions of people are created and embedded in, including indigeneity in the Andes. However, as we can see with the case of Gaston, it is important to be attentive to how this concept is mobilized. De La Cadena explains how the term mestizo is used by Cusqueño people to resist essentializations of identity that serve to overdefine them. Within the colonial hierarchy of race in Peru, the categories of Indian, mestizo, and white are intimately associated with class, education, urbanization, and more. Many, perhaps indigenous people, choose to identify with the mestizo category as it allows them the prospect of urbanization and social mobility, but at the same time to maintain indigenous practices. This practical use of mestizaje works around overly essentialist categories of identity. We can also think of Andean indigeneity as mestizaje in the sense that it has been and continues to be shaped by many fusions and changes, many of which have been introduced by indigenous people. The potatoes we eat are indigenous Andean. They've been cultivated by the people in the Andes for thousands of years. 
However, maybe the Lomo Soldado can become an indigenous Andean dish as well. We should not limit what indigenous culture can become. Peruvian cuisine is mestizaje, but so are all cuisines, and the histories of their mixture deserve to be analyzed and investigated rather than washed over. While the Lomo Soldado is delicious, it is perhaps more interesting and productive to try to understand the complicated forces that brought into being, rather than taking it for granted as a fusion of love. Though it may very well have been cooked with love, at least it tasted like it. Thank you, D.